What's up, everybody? Welcome to Omnipotent Health and Fitness episode number one. Our guest today is a board-certified naturopathic physician from Scottsdale, Arizona. She specializes in women's health and endocrinology, but her skills don't end there. She's an amazing wife and mother and has an uncanny ability to make a toddler's play kitchen look like it belongs on HGTV. So please join me in welcoming the person whom my wife has a massive girl crush on, Dr. Tara Burke. Hello, Tara. Oh. Hi. <laughs> well, wasn't that a nice intro? <laughs> Thank you, Albert. You're very welcome. How are you doing today? I am doing really, really well. It's a beautiful day here, so no snow here. <laughs> yes, yes, it's uh, quite snowy over here. So I wanted to start our interview with um, essentially your story, uh, how you you know how you grew up, and then how you ended up becoming a naturopathic physician. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in Canada. I grew up on an acreage there. Um, and really what got me into naturopathic medicine was um, when I went to Belize um, on an anthropology minor. I was an anthro minor in my undergrad. And so we went to the jungle of Belize and we were studying howler monkeys there, black howler um, monkeys. And if any, I mean, if anybody knows me well, I don't know why I went to Belize. I mean, it is totally, I'm not a jungle person. Um, so, but I thought it would be a great experience. Um, and so I, I went there and I got really, really sick when I was down there. And at the time, my intentions were just to go to traditional medical school. Um, I was working towards genetics. I, I wanted to be a medical geneticist, and I loved that. But coming home, um, I, I got sick while I was there. Um, it was like a gastro um, something or other, and I just never felt the same upon returning. Um, I went to multiple doctors, tried to see if anybody could help me, and, and no one could. Um, so at the time, the gentleman I was dating's mother suggested seeing a master herbalist. And I was like, no, this is, this is not for me. It's made up. Like, this is not a thing. Right. Fast forward, I was desperate enough to go, and she changed my life. I felt so much better. She finally listened to me. Um, and within a few visits, I was feeling back to normal. Um, and so I kind of did a 180 and decided that I was going to go into naturopathic medicine and help people um, like myself who felt a little bit lost or forgotten. That's incredible. That's like an incredible story. I mean, to to one, not even really realize why you were an anthropology major and uh, or minor, went to Belize on a college trip and um, eventually got sick from there. And because of that sickness, eventually led to you becoming a naturopathic uh, physician, which is absolutely incredible. Honestly, sometimes you just don't realize, um, you know, the path that you're going to end up going on. Um, yeah. So out of curiosity, because this is actually a really common thing that I hear from um, patients who see traditional physicians, um, allopathic and osteopathic physicians is, um, you, you know, you were also very skeptical as a patient when you came back from Belize to go see a master herbalist. What was it that eventually, you know, led you to actually going to see, um, see her? I, just desperation being like, I will do anything to feel better at this point anything. So what were your symptoms? So I had um, upset stomachs to the point where I wouldn't even leave the house. And it was causing a lot of anxiety to even leave and be like, is there a washroom nearby? I feel nauseous. I, my stomach is so, so upset. Um, and so it was causing me to miss out on a lot of my life, just sitting at home because I was so nervous to leave. Mm. So it, essentially it sounds like, um, you know, what we would call like IBSD um, or, or IBS. And so do yeah. you, what, uh, what did the, um, you know, I assume you sought a um, traditional medical physician first before you saw the master herbalist. Yeah. What, what was their diagnosis? What did they tell you? Well, I saw my PCP first and he, you know, tried really, really hard to, to find something for me. And when I first came home, I had a parasite. And so I had gone to urgent care there or the equivalent of urgent care and they gave me an antiparasitic. 
um, which solved that problem, but just my digestive tract was <laughs> never the same. <laughs> And so I ended up eventually going to somebody that I had found who was also like just an MD, um, but who thought a little bit outside of the box. And so she did more testing for like H. pylori or kind of outside what my classical symptoms would be. But the eventual diagnosis was, you know, IBS. Wow. So how that is that is so interesting. And have you reached out to her since then? And, you know, what do you remember? What was the treatment? What did she give you? So I have not reached out. I looked one time on, on her um, website to, to send her a message of, of thanks, but her, her kind of practice has changed a little since then where she does almost like an onboarding and then you get to see her as a patient. I think she's just gotten so busy. I mean, she had a reputation um, even when I saw her. So um, you know, she what she had provided for me was something called a bureau gast, if, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it's actually um, Swedish bitters. So it has a few different bitters in there, things like chamomile um, to help with digestion. So it primes that digestive tract. And then she had also given me um, tea pills. So traditional Chinese medicine tea pills. And for the life of me, I cannot remember what the actual tea pill um, was or the formula. And I wish I, wish I did. That's incredible. So yeah. <laughs> this is going to sound ironic, um, but uh, obviously in traditional medical school, uh, we didn't study traditional Chinese medicine, and I'm sure you know way more <laughs> about traditional Chinese medicine than I do. <laughs> so can you enlighten me? Like, what is traditional Chinese medicine? Like, I have a vague notion of acupuncture. Um, we had, you know, an acupuncturist come like for a yeah. half a day in medical school and that was it. But uh, beyond that, what what is traditional Chinese medicine? Yeah, so it is a completely different way of thinking about medicine than the Western world. So it really centers around a lot of organ systems. Um, and in, I guess, how I look at it is it's really constitutional medicine. So when you're doing an intake for traditional Chinese medicine, you're asking, are you warm? Are you cold? Those type of um, symptoms that don't we don't always ask in, in the Western world. And it kind of falls into at least how I was trained is the acupuncture and then the herbal sides. We had training in both of those in, mm -hmm. in naturopathic medical school. Mm -hmm. And so um, the acupuncture points, there's meridians that run along the body with different points where the chi is supposed to come up. And that's when you insert uh, an acupuncture needle in that when you're thinking of the traditional sense, you're, you're hitting those meridians and each of those meridians are a different organ system. So liver in Chinese medicine is very different than liver in Western medicine. And then there's the herbal side. And so these have been around for many, many years or usually um, either teas that are, are formulated or tea pills, which are really, really, really small little um, herbal preparations. You take multiple um, a day um, to, to address whatever it is. So you might have liver chi stagnation and there's, you know, a formula and an acupuncture um, protocol, you know, that, that a provider would, would make for you. It's, it's very, it's very, very interesting. And I think a lot of the kind of acupuncture research that's come out is in pain and not so much um, the meridian, but, you know, working at, at pain, um, which is also very, very interesting, just not, you know, what I do a lot of in my practice. Right. Right. There's a lot of ways I want to take this conversation at this moment, but um, I'm going to touch on acupuncture just a little bit more because mm -hmm. I remember when you were pregnant, um, is it true? You actually did acupuncture on yourself to induce labor. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my well, gosh, myself, that's my, bananas. my mom, my poor mom <laughs> was recruited. <laughs> But yes, so I was, I guess I was due on the, on the 27th and it was um, a few days prior to that. I was like, I am done. I want this baby out. I've had it. <laughs> and so that evening I, I did a few points or picked out a few points that are the traditional labor induction. Um, a couple of them are right kind of in this, this meaty part of your hand. And I got, I did my one side and then I left my other and I was like, mom, you got to put it, see where I put it here, put it right there. And as soon as she put it in, I could just feel the, it's, it's like a, it, acupuncture shouldn't hurt. It shouldn't be like a bee sting sensation. It should be a pulling, drawing, warmth type. 
And I, I just felt that. And I was like, mom, if I go into labor, it is you that it was this point. And sure enough, a couple hours later, I was in labor. My water had broken. Oh my goodness. That is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. Did you, was your labor, I mean, was your pregnancy, it sounds like it was pretty difficult for you. I mean, yeah, I, I did not like being pregnant at all. <laughs> um, yeah. I was really sick for at least the the first few months and then kind of off and on sick and just tired and no, no, thank you. It was, it was not fun, but. Well, it, it makes sense why you induce labor with acupuncture. Yeah. That's honestly, that's so incredible. That's like one of the craziest stories. And yeah. your mom, is she like, um, you, you know, is she into, um, you know, naturopathic medicine at all? Like, does she have any background or you just trusted her with a needle? You're just like, just yeah, just right there. Trust. I mean, it's your mom. You trust your mom, right? You know, you're like, they're not going to hurt you. Uh, but no, she, <laughs> she doesn't. She's only into it. I think, well, she's always, my mom's been very, very um, conscious about diet and lifestyle and, and those kind of things, clean beauty products, all of that. Um, but acupuncture, no. <laughs> That's, that's incredible. Um, yeah. I love that story. So uh, I guess the other fork that I was going to take when we were talking about traditional Chinese medicine, you mentioned the herbal teas that, um, you know, that they would often prescribe. And did you say that the master herbalist that you saw when you had that parasitic infection prescribed you some herbal teas to take and that seemed to help? Was it immediate or how long did it take? What was that like? Yeah, so they were tea pills. It wasn't, um, so some traditional Chinese medicine um, doctors, they have um, kind of like a back room and then a front room with all these different herbals and they'll like custom blend something for you. She didn't have that. She had the preparations. So an example of one would be like free and easy wanderer. And there's obviously a Chinese name for that too, which I mean is you know, so it was those tea pills. And so those are the little like tiny balls, but so it wasn't, I mean, it's a custom blend in which she took my constitution into account and my symptoms, but didn't blend it herself. So interesting. Um, again, there's like two forks that I want to take this discussion. Uh, one of them that I'll touch on later, but I want to touch on the differences between like allopathic and osteopathic versus naturopathic. If you're familiar mm -hmm. with that and what you study, because in my experience, like, you know, we didn't, we didn't study any of these things. We didn't study like herbs or like acupuncture or even nutrition very much, which nutrition was a big part. One of the ones that I was just like, I can't let this go. And I, I'm just going to do my own research and really learn the stuff on my own. Um, but I think I want to touch on that just a bit later. The other fork that I want to take this on is, um, you know, I know that you practice in a, in a way that's way more evidence-based, um, like you really rely on the literature and things like that. And, you know, I was wondering, obviously, with things that like with herbal teas, for example, and herbal pills, why do you think it is that there isn't so much literature on these things for different symptoms? I mean, one hypothesis that I was potentially thinking about is, you know, it probably relies on the combination of like these 10 different things. And how are you going to control for like 10 different things when everything needs to be narrowed down to one thing. But really, if you think about it, you could have a synergistic effect with multiple different factors. But at the same time, for the sake of science, I totally understand the need to narrow it down to just one variable. Um, so that was one reason. But I was wondering if you had any more um, thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. There's there's herbals like maca, great for adrenals, great for stress support, great for female hormone support. And so it's not like it does one thing and you can measure that one thing. Sorry, what was that? Maca? Maca. maca? Um, how do you spell that? I, I'm taking notes too. M-E-C-A? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I was studying Tim Ferriss and I realized that he takes notes while he's going. And, um, you know, that's... <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And I mean, there's, you know, pharmaceuticals, there's money there too. And there's not always money. I think when it comes to herbal preparations as, as well, or the same, I mean, um, um, who, who owns the patent for aspirin? Um, Bayer. Oh gosh. Bayer. Yeah. They own Iberogast now. So there is interest in oh, it. Really? I think it's just so hard wow. to control variables. Yeah. 
That's so interesting. I didn't know that they they own what was it? Ibera gas? Ibero gas. Please don't make me spell that. <laughs> I'm horrible spelling. I'm actually I'm, horrible at spelling as well. So, so let's see here. I've just Googled it. I B E R O G A S T. Thank you. Thank you. And what yeah. is that used for? That's the that's one of the products that she had prescribed for me. It's a digestive bitter. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's only for digestion. I, I mean, there's a ton of, for example, there's chamomile, I believe, in there. And chamomile. I mean, everybody knows chamomile as like a tea that you drink to help fall asleep or calm you down. Right, so again, right. does multiple things. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Um, ma maca, what is that used for again? You mentioned adrenal and... Um... Yeah. What I use it um, most often for is female hormone support. Okay. Um, so, and I, and I mean, there's, you know, chase tree and, you know, there's so many different herbals that can work rhodiola that are in preparations that, you know, really don't do one thing. Um, you know, not, it's not like having, you have a bacterial infection and you take an antibiotic and that antibiotic is exactly for the, for that bacteria, which is a blessing and a curse in my, in, in my practice, but more of a blessing to say, Hey, if you have, if you're feeling stressed out and your female hormones are imbalanced, well, then I have a herb for you that does both, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's often it's like, um, you know, an allopathic medicine where yeah. somebody might have anxiety, but then they also have tachycardia or a fast heart rate, and you might prescribe a beta blocker for that. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely killing two birds with one stone is, is always great. Um, yeah. With herbals, are there mm -hmm. significant side effects? I mean, we're all familiar with, you know, all the pharmacology and all the side effects with um, traditional medicine. Are there side effects with the herbals as well? Absolutely. And that's one of the, something that I run into often is you can absolutely have side effects from herbals as well as medications or interactions between the two. Right. So sometimes I have patients coming in on multiple different herbals or medications and not realizing, hey, these two can't go together. And one of the common ones that a lot of people have heard of is St. John's wort, right? That that can interact with a lot of antidepressants or birth control or different, that it's a beautiful herbal, but it has, you know, a higher potential to interact with. Um, side effects, you know, that that is dependent on the patient um, as, as well as just no side effects from, from different herbals. So there's certain families that are more likely to create, you know, allergic reactions, right. Just, just kind of like hay fever would be right. That right. you're more likely to get a rash or an effect from it. Um, and it, it just depends. And you, that's important of a good, you know, good intake to make sure that they don't have a contraindication or to say, what medications are you on? So we know we're being safe. Yeah, absolutely. I, like I said, in um, medical school, we never really spoke about herbs or any of these like alternative therapies mm -hmm. at all. Um, so it's so interesting. And thank you for enlightening me about all these things. Um, I know we sort of touched on like, there are things that can affect cytochrome P450 and the liver and things like that. But, uh, you know, going down the rabbit hole, we just didn't spend a lot of time with these things. Um, how much time did you guys spend in your studies learning about, you know, even traditional Chinese medicine or herbs or even nutrition, yeah. especially nutrition? I'm extremely curious how much time you guys spent with nutrition yeah. as well. Uh, I should have looked it up before I talked to you. I, oh, I don't it's know no problem. Just a ballpark is totally fine. No. So what, so kind of, well, at least at, at my school, the first two years are very basic sciences, just I mean, going through medicine, you know, physiology, those kind of things. And in the last two years, we're doing a lot of clinical rotations, but also have um, kind of, I don't know if they, they're not selectives because you have to do them, but classes like acupuncture, you know, herbals, diet, nutrition, those type of things. And so we do that for the last year. There are multiple of them. You know, we go through the body system. So there's like a cardiovascular, a nervous system one. So, um, I mean, a, a lot. <laughs> Didn't you guys, um, you, you have to take the same board exams that we do. Isn't that correct? Uh, like we do the USMLE, you know, step one, two, three type thing. Do you have something like that? 
we have something similar. It's not the same as, as yours. So we do after the first two year, the basic, um, uh, God, what is it called? Um, I don't even remember what it's called in here, but it's like the basic sciences. I think it would be kind right. of matched up. Don't you do one at two years too? Yeah, we do our step one. So it's just USMLE step one, two, and three. Um, one and two are before you graduate medical school. And then three is in your first year of residency. Okay, so, so I already took that as well. Yeah, so step, so it'd be kind of like your step one, I think. And then okay. the second one um, is right, you graduated and then you take it. Um, and that is not so much physiology, but clinical stuff mm -hmm. at that point. And it's also testing acupuncture, and then we had um, one that you could take for pharmacology as well. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So in medical school, we had, um, they call them standardized patients and you would like do your physical exam on them and then they would, you know, fake a symptom okay. or something. You have to figure it out. Did you guys have something like this with like acupuncture where like somebody comes in and you got to like perform acupuncture on them and things like that? Um, I mean, part of our testing and our acupuncture classes was yes, doing points. Um, and so you would be like given a list and you, you would have to perform them. And then the teacher would come, you'd be paired up with somebody else and, and you'd have to, without help, do those points. Yeah. But not I, for, not <laughs> to, you know, it was at this, at the school, um, not, you know, <laughs> not during I was just our thinking year. like, okay. how, how hysterical would it be if like, all right, you have to induce labor in this pregnant lady. If you don't do it, you're failing. <laughs> No. And I mean, acupuncture works different on different people too. So, I mean, you know. And so, um, you know, out of, out of curiosity, it looks like we have just a, a question that popped up. What are yeah. the pros and cons of acupuncture? What does the science say about it in general? I know that there's a lot of broad uses for acupuncture, um, but in, in my experience, it seems like acupuncture of the alternative therapies is one of the most well-studied, actually. So, um, yeah, what does the literature say right now on it? Yeah, I mean, it's really dependent on conditions. So it, it, it depends. And I think the best research or best science has probably been done on pain. And there's good research behind that. Um, the last time I looked into it, I believe they were thinking it was due to substance P, the release of substance P. So, I mean... I'm not caught up on my acupuncture research itself, but um, for certain conditions, there's been more research behind it than others. Right. Again, yeah. it's hard because it's all constitutional, right? So not a, somebody might be coming in with, you know, infertility, but then you're also picking points based on, are they warm? Are they cold? Taking their tongue and pulse, which is part of that traditional Chinese medicine intake. Right. No, absolutely. You know, I've always like found the subject of placebos fascinating because, you know, just because something is a placebo doesn't mean that it's not having the desired effect that you want anyways. And so if it's not hurting you and it helps you, then, then why not? Um, you know, there, there was a study done um, where they took patients who um, were going to get an arthroscopy of their knee mm -hmm. to like remove certain debris and things like that. And this, this study could never be done today. It would never pass IRB, but what <laughs> they did a randomized control study where, um, patients actually received like the clean out and then patients just received an incision and they didn't do oh. anything. And they essentially had equal results that were equivalent to oh. each other. And they, they could never do this like study nowadays, but like, that's just like, it's insane to me, the, the power of what your brain can do, um, which is incredible. Yeah. So yeah, mind over matter sometimes, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, shifting gears a little bit towards like your current practice, um, you know, how, how do you approach just, you know, a, a patient in general, for example, let's say you, mm -hmm. um, yourself came in and your history was, hey, I was studying monkeys in Belize and now I have IVSD and, um, you know, all of these things and uh, GI pain and anxiety and agoraphobia with going out and all these things. Mm -hmm. um, where do you start with that? What's your process? Yeah. So I see my new patients for 45 minutes to an hour in length. Um, and so I, we talked about this before, but really, um, spending time with them to let them tell me their story. 
So not interrupting to ask a ton of questions always until the end to clarify things or add additional information. But there's so much information to be gained in that 45 minutes to say, you know, I don't have diarrhea at home. I only have diarrhea when I'm out or, you know, I, I'm fine at home. I don't get heart palpitations at home, but when I'm out, I do. So just instead of being like, you have heart palpitations. Okay. Well, let's get you in for an, but clarifying what is going on. What is their history? What has happened before? Where were they? What were they doing? All of those things. And there's, there's so much that I learn from what a patient tells me versus the questions I ask. And of course, questions ask to be asked later are important to clarify, but it's the story where I really, really gain so much information. No, absolutely. And that's probably one of the biggest complaints I hear from some of my colleagues that, you know, we wish we had more time yeah. to speak with a patient and hear their story. And I feel like that's so important. And something that just <clears throat> gets overlooked a bit is even the process of telling the story to somebody that's actually present and they're listening to you, I feel like can be so healing in a way, just, yeah, yeah, yeah very therapeutic, um, which is uh, really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and, but your, uh, your specialty is in endocrinology. Um, and what's kind of like your bread and butter type of patient that comes in to see you? Yeah, I'd say I kind of have two. I ha see a lot of thyroid patients, specifically hypothyroid patients. Um, and then I also see a lot of female hormone patients, whether that's irregular cycles or a, a diagnosis like PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Those are, are probably what I see most often. And then I do see a lot of menopausal patients as well, um, looking to either balance their hormones or have hormonal support in a herbal format or bioidentical. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> let's go into, let's go into some of these things individually, mm -hmm. if that's okay with you. So I saw a question kind of pass briefly about hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I remember correctly, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is probably, I think the most common reason for hypothyroidism right now. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I guess to the last time I looked. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's an autoimmune thyroid condition. So your, your gland is being destroyed by, you know, self. Um, I see it a lot after pregnancy or childbirth, um, or sometimes in families. Mm. And what are, you know, for people who don't know what the manifestations are of low thyroid, what, what are the manifestations that you see with hypothyroidism? Yeah, it's everything kind of slowed down. So metabolism is slowed down, constipation, cold intolerance, fatigue, you know, feeling a little bit down, um, very, very cold. Those are kind of the typical symptoms that I'll see hair loss, nail changes. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, if you see all of those manifestations, it becomes, you know, you know, you, you start to pinpoint on that. But um, in my experience, endocrinology is so difficult because a lot of the symptoms, you don't tend to manifest all the symptoms at the same time, yeah. and they tend to be very nonspecific, such as fatigue. Yes. And so anything can be fatigued, right? Like you just didn't yes. get enough sleep is like fatigue. Um, you haven't been exercising is fatigue. Your stress is fatigue. Like you have a migraine is fatigue. Like everything can be fatigue. And I bet mm -hmm. that's probably one of the most common reasons people go to see you. So then how do you approach it from there? Somebody comes in with yeah. fatigue and, and maybe like a vague sense of feeling cold, but it's February in Boston. So it's like, yeah. So who knows? Yeah. yeah. Um, I usually do fairly comprehensive labs. So taking a look at a full thyroid panel, taking a look at other things that could be causing fatigue, iron deficiency, cortisol levels, those, you know, things that would be classically associated. And again, taking a good history. Is this the first time it's happened? You're just feeling cold today? Or has this been happening forever? Do you have thyroid disease that runs in your family? All like puts little red flags to be like, okay, it's more likely this category or this category. Yeah. And, and a lot of my patients have already had pretty thorough workups from their PCPs that they, that they may have seen or family care providers. Um, and so sometimes it's just additional testing or trending, looking at, okay, well, your TSH was a high normal last. Let's double check now that it's been a year. And if it's trending upwards, well, that again, makes it more likely. Let's then check your antibodies or something like that. Right. 
So interesting. Do you, <clears throat> so let's say the labs come back, it looks like they're hypothyroid. Are there anything that you can do besides just um, giving medications, or replacing it with like levothyroxine or something like that, um, that might help hypothyroidism or lifestyle modifications? Yeah. So, I mean, most of my patients that do have hypothyroid are on medication, um, whether that's synthetic or natural desiccated, something like that to support their, their thyroid if they truly, truly have that diagnosis. Um, but then it's also some dietary counseling as well to make sure we're not contributing to, to the problem. And something I see often is iodine intake. If you look on the, the blogs, it seems like everybody's like, take iodine for your thyroid kelp or whatever that is. But iodine has a narrow therapeutic say, index. So you can just really kelp? overdose. Did you say kelp? Yeah. People take kelp? Seaweed. Like, yeah. Oh, interesting. I had no idea. What is the, what's like the theory behind that? I'd never heard of that. Iodine. That, oh. So if you have too little iodine, you absolutely can have thyroid disease. Absolutely. But we live in America. So yeah, most everything people is salty, here get like enough crazy. in their diet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Making sure they're not in any preparations that are, you know, a lot of patients are very, very informed. So they might be on, on things, that, you know, herbals that might be thyrosuppressive, you know, just taking that into account. I mean, taking a look at lab patterns, something I see is elevated lipids in thyroid patients that have gone, you know, unmanaged or undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which again, kind of speaks to the difficulty of endocrinology as a whole, because they all sort of intertwined with each other. So the endocrine system, you release hormones and by definition, a, a hormone is essentially something that acts at a target that's away from the site that it was produced at. Um, and oftentimes, you know, <clears throat> your decreased thyroid levels can affect your menstrual cycle or vice versa, mm -hmm. the amount of estrogen that you have. Um, so how do you begin to start teasing that out? Let's say that you have a patient that comes in with um, symptoms that might be manifestations of two different things that might be of, um, you know, your menstrual hormones versus something that's originating from your thyroid. How, what are the tests that you're looking for that begin to kind of separate those? Yeah. So what I typically run in that case is a, a TSH checking in with the thyroid function itself. So TSH is that marker from your brain to your thyroid that tells it to make more hormone. The higher it is, it's like your brain screaming at your thyroid, make more hormone. We don't have enough. And then I'm also looking at those hormones that are coming from the thyroid itself. So checking that their TSH looks good, but also their, their free hormones as well. Um, if they have a strong family history, if I'm feeling something, um, when I'm doing a physical exam, considering adding those antibodies on as well. Cause sometimes I, what I'll see is positive antibodies in a patient thyroid antibodies, um, but a normal thyroid panel. And that might put them at higher risk of developing thyroid, you know, a, a TSH that's going up in the future. So monitoring more often, and then taking a look at those female hormones as well to make sure they look good. And like I said, a lot of patients that come in have already had the basics to say, you know, ruling in, ruling out why they're having menstrual irregularities. But typically what I'll do is, is test certain female hormones at different points in their cycle, if they're cycling somewhat regularly. And if they're not, then just pulling it at any time to try to figure out what's going on. Do you have too much estrogen? Do you have too little progesterone? Do you have both? Do you have too much testosterone? What is going on? Right. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I've always found women's health very challenging, even in medical school, because it's it's one of those things that's like highly inconsistent among like temporally spaced um, as they age, it changes or early on, it changes before puberty, it changes mm -hmm. during puberty, it changes during pregnancy, it changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so can you just kind of speak to, I guess, the changes that you might experience, um, you know, as you age, let's even go after mm -hmm. puberty, because I know it gets like a little bit wonky going from, um, you know, infancy to puberty, but yeah. after puberty to um, postmenopausal, what are like some of the changes that you see? And um, actually, let's start there. 
Yeah. So thyroid specific TSH changes, usually what is normal for an 18 year old, a TSH value or a thyroid function is much different than an 80 year old. So an 80 year old's TSH that's on the upper end of the reference range might just be normal versus when you're 18 is, is not. Another thing that we see or that interaction is estrogen. So whether you start taking a birth control pill, you're on bioidentical hormones, or you've gone through menopause, that can change thyroid function as well. So typically when we have less estrogen, our thyroid works better as well. So if a patient, you know, although that's, that's, you know, taking something like a birth control pill is not part of that normal aging process. It's something to take into account and ask patients about because it's so common. We see a lot of patients, you know, either taking HRT therapy post-menopause or on some sort of hormones pre-menopause. Yeah, absolutely. What's your, um, what's your take on hormone replacement therapy um, post-menopausal? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do a lot of it. So I, I think I'm a little bit biased, um, but I'm a very conservative practitioner. So I'm not making, you know, I'm not aiming for somebody to feel 20 years old. Again, it's, it's the lowest dose possible to get rid of those symptoms. And as long as we're being safe, that you don't have any risk factors that, that adding a bioidentical hormone is, is going to be contraindicated for that patient. Um, and I mean, I'm always using bioidentical hormones for, for the most part as well. So replacing what you would have. And there's so many wonderful products on the market nowadays, whether that's patches, um, progesterone can be done orally. That's bioidentical just from the pharmacy. It's not compounded. You know, they have, they have a lot available now to support women. So by bioidentical, you mean you, you make your body makes it naturally. That's what it would be that, body. that same hormone. It's not like. Um, in the past, they were using like horse urine, like estrogen from horse urine. Um, oh which my goodness. had a lot of I had risk no idea. Factors. Seriously, from horse oh, urine? Yeah. yeah. What in the world? What yeah, in the yeah. world? Yeah. It's, a, it's a little bit of a ride reading about it. I mean, but it worked, it, you know, it, it is estrogen. So, um, but you, you know, the safety profiles for transdermal estrogens are much, much better. So over the skin, um, patch technology, much better, much safer than the oral old non-bioidentical hormone. Yeah. So <clears throat> obviously I'm a pathologist. So I don't actually, I don't see patients um, generally, very rarely do I do that. And so out of curiosity, the thing that we learn in medical school with estrogen replacement therapy tends to be hypercoagulability or that your body tends to clot more, more often. What's mm -hmm. the literature say on that? Um, I know you say you go transdermal. Is there um, more current literature on hormone replacement therapy, specifically estrogen in relation to hypercoagulable states? Yes. So that's a question that I ask all my patients. Have you had a stroke? Have you had clots in the past? And personally me, I won't, I won't prescribe it at that point. Um, but the, the literature is much better for, again, the transdermal versus oral missing that, that first pass metabolism. So there, I mean, there's absolutely, it's also about quality of life, right. Um, as well. So if somebody is so miserable, um, that they don't feel like they can get out of bed in the morning because of their hormones. Well, I mean, there's, that's something to take into consideration too. And it's all about, you know, risks versus benefits, going through the risk, going through the benefits and giving that information. I mean, in, for my patients that are on HRT therapy, I spend a good portion on education that these are the risks, but these are the benefits. Absolutely. Do you, how, how much stock do you put in, um, you know, a person who's uh, currently a smoker because that increases your risk of blood clots on, on top of like hormone replacement therapy? Like what is your threshold for, you're like, okay, this is too many risks for me to start um, estrogen therapy. Yeah. I'd be, like I said, I'm very conservative. So it'd be zero. <laughs> okay. So be, no. any risk factor at all, you're like, no. I, I mean, there's a, so for example, five years after you've gone through menopause, well, I mean, that's a lot of patients don't realize what they've been missing until that point. So I'm, a, I stretch that, you know, a, a little bit, but any of the big risk factors that I'm, I'm really, really concerned about, um, heart health, especially I'm a no-go or 
breast cancer, uterine cancer, those kind of things. I mean, if somebody has a family history, well, then I'm a little bit more careful or, or may monitor it more often or really how the, make sure you're getting your mammogram, make sure you're getting your, whatever that may mean. Um, but, you know, I, I, I usually refer out for anybody that's very, very high risk. Right. Very cool. Um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to shift gears just a, a touch because I'm interested in the topic as well. And I don't know mm -hmm. how much uh, of you, your specialty or how much you learned about the gut microbiome or uh, how mm -hmm. you feel about it. Um, could you speak to that? How much training did you get with that? And um, how do you approach that with patients? Because um, just like endocrinology, I feel like GI symptoms are just as nonspecific. It's like, yes. I've got a little bit of pain sometimes randomly throughout the day. So yeah, yeah how, do you, how do you go about thinking about that specifically in its relation to the gut microbiome? Yeah, I mean, digestive health has a pretty special place in my heart just because of my, my history. So right. yeah, I do a lot of um, digestive testing when it comes to that, looking at the microbiome. So there's a few specialty labs that will take a look at good flora, bad flora, you know, looking at yeast, looking at parasites, and then testing inflammatory markers or digestive, you know, markers beyond just you know, a, a, a panel that you could get at Sonora Quest that's just checking for pathogenic or, or the bad bugs, right? Um, so I'm all about that microbiome. I mean, even the, even the digestive tract for hormone health is so important. Your, your hormones metabolized through the liver, excreted out through the gut. So if you're constantly constipated, well, you're holding on to things that are packaged to be excreted. That can influence even estrogen levels that now they're starting to unravel in there, be reabsorbed into the system. So, you know, it's, it's, non-specific, right? You can have two and it's often trying to look at the whole picture and be like, okay, you have digestive issues. You have hormone issues. We need to treat both of these or else we're just going to end up back where we are. So I can balance your hormones. I can give you herbals or, or medications, you know, bioidentical hormones to balance that out. But we never address that digestive flora or the microbiome. We're, we're not going to solve the problem. We're not going to solve that root cause of what's going on. And why are you always constipated? Is there an imbalance? Do you have a, a, a bug? Do you have SIBO? What is going on? Um, and let's treat that, that pathology to solve a whole host of other problems. Yeah, it's so interesting. The gut microbiome was one of those subjects that <clears throat> was is really very essentially pretty novel. Nobody was really studying it for a while, but um, just as of recently, there's just all the studies on gut microbiome. It's kind of like the, the big thing. Yeah. Um, and when you say that you get the um, gut flora tested, is that just a stool sample essentially that, that you get? Um, and, and that's just through a generic lab, like Sonora Quest will do that for you? It's not Sonora Quest. There's there's different specialty lab companies that will will do that um, for you and take a look. Usually, it's a stool sample. Yes, um, if we're testing something more like SIBO, which is is in the small intestinal, so small intestinal and bacterial overgrowth (SIBO), that's looking up here, and so that's a breath test. So it's actually looking at the gases that are produced. So you like drink like a sugar solution and then breathe over the course of two three hours, and they can test the breath gas to say, okay, this hydrogen or this methane is elevated. There's something fermenting that and releasing that, which would be a positive test. So that's more of the small intestine versus lower intestine. I, I'll use the stool testing. Yeah. It's so incredible. There's, um, I was listening to a podcast, this guy named Naveen Jain. He's like this very successful billionaire of all sorts of different things, but he started this company called Viome. Um, and what they're doing is they sequence your gut microbiome and they're trying to um, analyze that wow. data to the specific foods that you would be best oh, wow. suited for. It's really, really interesting, wow. cutting edge stuff. I don't know, I haven't looked at their research or anything, but it's just incredible. And even, you know, these very big, well-known medical journals are starting to publish on these things um, like Nature, uh, mm -hmm. Nature, which is like one of the big three medical journals, um, discussed, you know, depending on the type of gut flora that you had, um, was more likely to express a specific oncogene um, called P53 in certain areas wow. of your GI tract. So depending on 
whether you had, I forget the specific um, bacteria species, whether it was high or low, would express the P53 oncogene wow. um, or suppress it. And it was dependent on location. It's just so interesting to me, just um, the things that are coming out now. So yeah. What are your thoughts on it? How much, how much do you pay attention to the microbiome? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I think that it has a lot more to do with um, disease pathologies than we give it credit for currently. I mean, it's just like absolutely insane that you can have somebody who was obese and then you do like a fecal transplant and from a patient who was healthy and they'll just like start losing weight, like it'll just come, come right off. Um, and that, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that, right? Like, so first they give you all sorts of antibiotics to clear out your normal gut flora. And then they, exactly as it sounds, it sounds crazy, but they do fecal transplants and they change out your gut microflora for somebody else's gut microflora. And all of a sudden you're like shedding weight. Um, there's other um, uh, publications about people who had anxiety or depression and they did the same thing. Like they just uh, did fecal transplants and then all of a sudden their depression goes away. I mean, there's obviously something to it, um, yeah. but it's just, it's so interesting to me. Um, yeah. So let's see here, we're coming up on the hour. So I'm gonna just ask this uh, one question and, uh, and then we'll open it up to a Q and A after this. And I think it's gonna be kind of a fun question. So. Um, it's going to be about a, a magic genie. So you have a magic genie and you get two wishes. One wish that you can make can benefit the entire world, but you'll force the entire population to make this one lifestyle modification to okay. best improve their health. What would it be? And your second wish has to be selfishly for yourself. If you, you had a magic genie and you can't save the planet, no, like, you know, preventing any disease or anything like that. It's just strictly for yourself. What would it be? So let's start okay. with, um, let's start with the selfless one and then we'll go with the selfish one. Okay. Oh man, that, um, that is hard for, yeah. So for others, I mean, the one lifestyle modica would really be processed foods. I think um, getting rid of those processed foods out of the diet. Um, and I am guilty of this as well. I mean, I love ice cream. I love cheese whiz. I love all these things. But I wish that they were healthy because they taste so good. Um, so I, I wish that processed foods, that it was easier to eliminate those from, from people's diets. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I think that's, I think that's huge. Um, what I know we were going to finish up, but now I'm curious and you piqued my curiosity, what hormonal changes do you see with processed foods? And is there a trend of a specific type of processed foods or ingredient that you've noticed that causes these hormonal changes? No, it's just really those processed packaged foods, anything. And, and part of that is a lot of them are, are packaged in, in plastics themselves, which are known endocrine disruptors, depending what's in that, that plastic. And we've seen that be, you know, the whole BPA issue and water bottles and baby bottles, um, getting rid of that in itself because it affects hormone levels it, and, and it, it stays in your system. So, I mean... I, I have seen it's, it's, you know, partially about prevention that we can, we can absolutely change your hormone levels again. But if you're being exposed to the same things in, in foods, pesticides, herbicides, all of that, I make everybody, when they come to my house, take off your shoes. I don't want your, your mess from outside, <laughs> all your chemicals in my house, you know? Um, so making some of those simple, simple changes, um, to, to lower my burden of, of endocrine disruptors. Oh God. Now, I, now I feel so bad for wearing your shoes, even stepping into the doorway. No, not <laughs> at all. I have a sign on my front door to, to warn people. I use my son as an excuse. It's like, since little hands touch our floors, remove your shoes at the yes, door. Yes, it's cute. I remember <laughs> Really, that. it's me. I remember that. <laughs> Yeah. And so what's your one selfish wish? You had a magic genie, you wish for anything strictly for yourself, what would it be? Oh gosh, right now a massage, that would be wonderful. 
more time more I, I want more time with my son um well make sure you get uh you get your husband in on that <laughs> I'm sure they can I don't think you need a magic genie for that part no it is our it's our fifth wedding anniversary today so oh my gosh congratulations yeah happy anniversary thank you that's fantastic well um Tara thank you so much for coming and talking to all of us um you know we we truly appreciate it um, where can everybody find you if you do social media at all or, you know, how can they connect with you? Yeah, I'm horrible at social media, but I am, I do have an Instagram account and Facebook um, and it's just talk to Tara Burke. Um, and, you know, really my website has most of the information on there. So that's drtaraburke.com. But um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, get a hold of me. I, I'd love to answer them. Thank yeah. you, Tara. Thanks for coming on. Yeah.